two, three. Should, Should you, you rent, rent or, or buy, buy a house? house? What's up, guys? It's Humphrey. So the question of renting or buying actually comes up a lot in my life. And since I live at home, it's one of the questions I think about a lot, which is, should I rent or should I buy? Now, what is the best use of my money? I'm not actually too sure, but that's the purpose of today's video. I've actually invited two of my friends on the channel, and both of them are actually realtors, one in the Bay Area and one in Dallas, Texas, and we're gonna get their expert opinions on the matter. Now, for people like me, home prices can be a little bit confusing. So if you look at this Zillow listing in my area, this is a $1.99 million house for two bedrooms and two bathrooms, around 1,445 square feet. Now, if you do the math, that's about $1,350 per square foot in my area, and this is not even a single family home. This looks like a home for ants, basically. What is this? A center for ants? So that really poses a question of what is better, renting or buying, and does it depend on your region? So first, let me introduce our first realtor right now. Hi, Hi my name is Scotty, and I'm a real estate agent in the Bay Area. And our second realtor actually joins us from Dallas, Texas, and here he is. Hey, I'm Eric Mollenhoff. I am a realtor based in the Dallas Fort Worth area, specifically uh, Plano. Now, the truth is there's a lot to factor when it comes to figuring out if you should rent versus buy. So the first thing I asked both of my expert guests today was simply, what do you think the biggest factor is when it comes to renting versus buying a home? What would you consider? Personally, I think the biggest difference is what happens to your money. So when you're um, renting a home, the money goes to the landlord. That money is, in a sense, put in a trash can lit on fire, which may be a little... <laughs> A little bit dramatic, but okay. it is money that you never ever see again. Uh, now, when you pay a mortgage, though, you know, in your own house, that money then goes into the home, hopefully appreciates over time, and you get to recoup that money when you sell your home in the future. So it seems that Scotty is more of the mind that when you rent, you're actually throwing your money away by not building equity in a home. In fact, this is one of the biggest draws of owning a home is capturing the appreciation of real estate values over the next 20 to 40 years and is often one of the most sought after factors of owning real estate. Now, is renting actually throwing money away since we still need to spend money to live? We'll answer that throughout today's video but first let's hear from Eric on what his biggest factor he considers is when it comes to buying versus renting a home. I think the most important thing when, when I'm thinking about it is how long you want to be in a certain location, not a specific um, you know, house or building, but in a specific city. So if you're going to be in a, a location for you know, five years or greater, then I think it's totally worth it to buy a house. The rule of thumb for most people is that if you're staying in a place for long enough five to seven years, it's worth it to buy a home because you're capturing a lot of the appreciation and you're spreading out the upfront costs of owning a home over the next 30 years. Renting, on the other hand, is better for someone who wants a lot more flexibility and may want to move around a lot. There are a lot of costs to owning that a renter may not want to pay. For example, closing costs, property taxes, maintenance expenses, interest on a mortgage, etc. One of the biggest things proponents of renting will say when it comes to renting versus buying is that they can take the down payment that they would have used on the house and actually invest it in the stock market to get a higher return. Essentially, if you're doing this, you're betting that the appreciation of your real estate is not going to be higher than that of your stock market return. And here's what Scotty has to say on that. Let's, let's use this past year as an example. Uh, you know, February of, or no, March of last year, you know, the real estate market, or I mean, the stock market took a really big hit and dropped sure. almost 50%, where the real estate market was much more solid. It like, actually went up over time and or at least stayed more stable. Uh, so I think real estate, although, you know, appreciations may be comparable of the two, depending on, you know, your, the area you're buying or the stocks you invest in, um, you know, it is much more of a stable means of money making, you know, passive income. Interesting. And in the meantime, your quality of life is also greatly influenced by it. So stocks are great, but they don't have, you know, you're not living in a stock. You know, you're living, you're living, you're living We're in living a, in the Tesla <laughs> stock right now, guys. You're living in a Tesla car. That's probably not too bad, but not in a Tesla stock. <laughs> that's right. So yeah, you actually, your quality of life is much more influenced by you uh, know, where you're, where you're residing more so than the, than the shares you own. Although in, you know, financially though, they, they both are great money makers. Definitely, you know, recommend putting money in stocks and in real estate. Um, obviously the barrier to entry for stocks is lower. Um, but yeah, much more of a stable, you know, means of income, which has been again proven by this past year. Right, you know, right. With unfortunately, with COVID. Another point I want to make here is that if you are indeed foregoing your down payment and instead using that money to invest, that requires a lot of discipline as well. And here's what Eric has to say about that: You have to be disciplined enough to do that. And so, if you're the type of person that can be disciplined and take that money and you set it aside each month and you say, "Hey, this is what I would be paying," and I'm going to put it in stocks. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, but rarely, rarely does that ever happen because what people like to do is they take that money they should be investing and they just go buy something stupid with it, like a new handbag or yeah. a Lambo or I something. Mean, yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, because we're like, everyone's human. So you see something, you have this extra pile of cash, you want to buy something fun or maybe something you need for your kids or something. But yeah, so. So after all this, let's say you still want to invest in the market and rent instead. We're going to go through some sample math on a median home in Texas to show you everything you should consider. But first, let's talk about the appreciation rates in California and Texas to figure out what we're up against as a renter. Because to make renting worth it over buying a home in the long haul, we would have to make more money investing than the appreciation of that home. So the average rate of uh, appreciation California. in California is 6.77%, nearly 7% over uh -huh. the 39 year time frame. And I'm saying, so that's the average of California. I'm, the Bay Area is likely going to be you know, a premium to that. So, and the right. stock market is about 7%. So yeah, your money, I mean, is gonna probably appreciate at comparable values, but I mean, I mean, the, the Bay Area real estate also is known to sometimes double and triple over the course right. of seven years. So, right. But your average is going to be relatively comparable, I would say. So it depends on your region, right? Maybe Absolutely. if you're in Georgia, where the appreciation might not be as high. Mm -hmm. Maybe putting your funds then in the stock market, you know. Would be worth it. Absolutely. But if you're in a, in a coastal city like San Francisco, mm -hmm. Seattle, LA, mm -hmm. New York, San Diego. San Diego, you might see higher appreciation rates and a lot more upside when it comes to investing in real estate. I think that also is because you're talking about coastal, that is a supply cap. So that's also really big. Because anytime oh, you're having a cap of supply, which the, on the peninsula or any coastal regions has, meet close to the water or surrounded by water, right. you know, that's really going to help bolster uh, the value or, or you know prices of the real estate. So yeah, so appreciation over the last year in Dallas-Fort Worth was 20%. 20%, wow. Historically, uh, it's right around 6%. Historically, right around um, 6%, right? Yeah. And right now, it's this last year, it's been 20% because it's just a crazy market, obviously, with uh, the super low interest rates and just the lack of inventory. So prices have gone up, which makes sense. It's how it's been across the country. But like in the Dallas Fort Worth area, median house price right now, I think is like 320. So let's say you wanted this. Okay. This is, this is median right here, right? Three bedroom, yep. two bathroom, um, 1,349 square feet. What do you think something like this rents for in Dallas? I mean, the interior looks a little homey, kind of nice, kind of updated. Yeah, something like that in and around Dallas, free bed with, you know, nice update. You're probably looking at $2,200, $2,300. So just like a cooking show, I've already done the math for you guys, and uh, it's already ready. And so as you can see on the left here, this is assuming a 7% appreciation rate for 30 years for this Dallas, Texas home with a median home price of $320,000. You can see that on the left, and you feel free to pause the screen right here, but on the left, after 30 years, you actually gain about $1.2 million in profit by buying. And if you were to rent, I assume that your rent would be $2,200 a month. And I actually didn't increase the rent at all. So if it was a fixed $2,200 per year, that's 792 k over 30 years. So if you took that down payment and you invested it instead and got 7%, well, you would get a 487 k return, which is totally fine, but it still would cost you a lot of money to rent instead of buy. One thing I do want you guys to pay attention to is the property tax rate. So in Dallas, it's 1.93%, and that's actually based on the assessed value of the home every single year. So if your house actually appreciates at a higher rate, you're gonna be paying more in property taxes every single year. Now, I also wanted to show you guys the 3.8% appreciation scenario. So this is the national average of real estate appreciation. And as you can see, the two situations are a lot closer in this case. Now, keep in mind, both of these situations are for 30 year time horizons. Let's say you had a one, two, or three year time horizon, and actually might make more financial sense to actually rent. Now, obviously these numbers can be toyed around with, but this is the general way you should be thinking about renting versus buying a home. In this particular situation, the benefit of buying over a long period of time far outweighs renting. And this is also assuming the rent stays fixed, which is something Scotty is really passionate about. You can also fix your costs. So when you lock in a rate with a bank, you know, for a 30 year loan term, you know, that, that then fixes your costs. No one can come around and raise your rent. No one can come and give right. you two months notice to have I didn't think about house. that. Yeah. So, so the budget is something that you kind of consider, which is like the, it'll be the same cost every single month reliably. It's a, it's a fixed cost reliably. You can then plan your life more accordingly based upon those costs. I didn't think about that. Yeah, that's smart. Thanks, bro. Thanks. Appreciate it. That is smart. <laughs> that is smart. Okay. It's awful to see when uh, I used to work in property management more. And, yeah. you know, when you give someone two months notice, I mean, it's a terrible thing to, to see because you have your life set up there. Giving someone six, 60 days to get their life in order and move, uh, you know, is a really, it's a hard 
hard thing to you know to ask somebody to do, and, and especially if they got a family or they got yeah, kids and stuff got, like that. You know, much stuff people have after <laughs> living somewhere for like five years, and you tell them oh, 60 days and you're out. That's you know, that's a lot to deal with. So you can avoid that that whole that whole. Now there are a lot of other bunch of intangibles as well. For example, pride of ownership is one. A lot of people love owning a home due to the pride of ownership factor, and saying that they own a house is like a big thing for a lot of people. If you don't care about pride of ownership, then renting might actually be a suitable option. The other intangible here is movement flexibility. So when you're buying a home, you're essentially planting your roots somewhere and it's gonna be hard for you to up and move to say, I don't know, the Bahamas or the Maldives. I guess one place you could move to is Azeroth, but that could be done in the comfort of your own home. So when it comes to renting, you can just up and leave and that's part of the advantages of renting. So if you want that nomadic, always on the go lifestyle, you have that option for you. So now let's go back to my conversation with Scotty and let's talk about some of the other intangibles as well. Pride of ownership is a great thing. And then also you can always update your own home. Updating a rental is, you know, lost in lost capital as well because you gotta give that home back in the future, if you have a, your own home, you can update it, make it your own, and, and that value that you you know in, input to the home actually stays there. And you know, again, you can recoup that in the future as well. Got it. Thank you, Scott. My pleasure, Humphrey. Thanks I for having me. I appreciate it. Bang, bang. So, with that said, I think some of the biggest factors when it comes to choosing renting versus buying are, for example, property taxes, appreciation rates, interest rates, the opportunity cost of your capital, as well as some intangibles like flexibility, security, the pride of ownership, and budget planning. I hope that you enjoyed today's video format. I know it's a little bit different than what you're used to, but hopefully you enjoy this new type of content. I plan to create a lot more video guys for you in the future. Now, while we all can't live in a Tesla stock, at least now we know a little bit more about the differences of renting versus buying. So thanks for being here and I'll see you in the next one. And for now, let's do the sub jar. So real quick, since we gained 3000 subs since our last video here. Well done, Humphrey. Thank you, sir. Uh, we are gonna shout out six comments uh, for every 500 subs. We shout out a comment and we put $20 in the sub jar. So go ahead, Scotty, take us away. So this $20 is for Peter Fries. Chase Yokohama, thank you. Seton, thank you from Humphrey. Yagami, thank you so much. Leo. And Mr. Scribble Didu. <laughs> be Perfect. That was great. Thanks. So make sure to subscribe if you'd like to be included in that. I think our jar is at $320 total and at $1,000, you guys get to decide what we invest in, which is pretty scary. <laughs> Take care. <laughs>